Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this session about continuous automated deployment with Apache Ace. Uh, we'll start by briefly introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Marcel Offermans. I'm a director at Luminous Technologies, which is a Dutch company. And I'm also a member at the Apache Software Foundation involved in the Apache Felix and Apache Ace projects and mentoring Celix at the moment. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague. Yeah. I'm uh, Jan Willem Janssen. I'm a software architect at Luminous Technologies. Marcel is my boss. I'm a community and PMC member of uh, Apache Ace and Apache Felix. Uh, my Twitter handle if you're interested. I'm not tweeting that, tweeting that much, but. So, what are we going to present today? Um, this talk is about continuous integration with Ace. So, we're first going to recap a bit on the traditional continuous in integration workflow. Um, then we're going to talk about how you, uh, if you're going to develop a modular, uh, 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 going to create modular software, how do you get from an ER to bundles? Um, next topic will be on versioning and baselining. Very important if you want to continuous deploy stuff. Since this is talk about Apache Ace, and maybe not all of you have any idea what Apache Ace is, we're gonna also present a bit on uh, Apache Ace itself, some basics, let it show how it uh, look like. And uh, follow up is that we're gonna show how we have set up our built environment and our continuous integration workflow using Apache Ace. And on the end, we are gonna give a live demo. Hopefully everything will work, demo gods. So to start, the traditional CI workflow without Ace or OHDI. It all starts with a, a central repository, source repository, for example, GitHub server version, and a continuous integration server, for, for example, Jenkins. Jenkins will be triggered upon a commit or polling or whatever, does its job, and the result will be an ER or WAR file. Now the problem with most people that are creating a CI workflow is I've got one target and I want to publish my ear or WAR file to that target. And how do you do that? There are many ways you can use Maven, custom build scripts uh, like uh, SCP or FTP, file shares, whatever. And this usually works for everybody because everybody does CI. But the problem gets bigger once you have multiple targets you want to deploy to. For example, you have a production environment, you have a testing environment. So you need to copy and create every time a new script that publishes your artifacts to that uh, target. And it's becoming more and more laborious once you have more and more targets. With Ace, it becomes a little less complicated. And we'll say that in the in a short while. Yep. Um, as John Willem already said, uh, once you start deploying to different targets, the problem is going to become a little bit more uh, big. And um, especially when you're also going from a more monolithic to modular uh, way of building your applications, this whole deployment uh, issue becomes bigger because suddenly you're not deploying one ear file uh, but instead you might have hundreds of small bundles that together make up your application and you need to deploy all of those onto your targets, probably in different configurations because, well, you've made the whole thing modular for a reason. Uh, so you might want to have different configurations. And uh, so that's, that's going to make uh, the deployment issue uh, in, more interesting. Uh, you probably need to automate it way sooner. Uh, another difference is with your ear files or war files, you're probably just versioning the thing as a whole. So you have one version and whenever you change uh, uh, your product, uh, you create a new version for it and, and that's it. Uh, in a modular environment, uh, you have all these different modules and probably you're gonna end up versioning them all independently uh, because you might wanna only bump version numbers when something actually changes and not just name all 200 bundles the same version. And um, the deployment itself, as I said, is also a little bit different 
with the ear file, you're just on every change, uh, redeploying that ear to your application server. And in a modular development environment, you only need to deploy the modules that have actually changed and all the rest can stay the same. And especially when you have lots of different targets, uh, that can mean your deployments are a lot faster. You don't need to actually restart your application to do that. So that's, that's a big uh, advantage and a big difference between the two styles of development. So just looking into what to version in an OSGI environment, there's basically two different things uh, that we version. Uh, first of all, the bundles, uh, and we version those to, to signal that their contents has changed. And uh, second thing that we version is all the packages that we export. And these packages usually contain the APIs that we share between different bundles and uh, we version those and change those versions to indicate that maybe these APIs have changed in some way. Um, for this talk, we're gonna focus mainly on versioning the bundles, um, and, but these are the two things in general that are versioned in OSGI. And the reason, like I said, to version bundles is so you can actually see whether they've changed and in some sense, what has changed inside these bundles. And that's a nice bridge to a term called semantic versioning. I'm not sure who of you are familiar with this term. Just a few hands, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, it's something that's uh, not only done uh, within the OSGI world, there's also a website, semver.com, which uh, presents a more generic semantic versioning model. It's basically uh, some kind of contract that you have that gives you some sense of uh, what every version bump means. And if you look at versioning in OSGI, a version consists of four parts, a major, minor, micro, and qualifier. The first uh, three ones are numeric, and uh, the last one is alphanumeric, and you can compare versions to each other. And um, semantic versioning basically says that if you make some kind of backward incompatible change, you should bump the major version. If you make a backward compatible change, for example, you have an API and you just added a new method to it, uh, that's a minor change. A micro change might be some implementation change, so no API, just implementation that changes a bug fix or something like that. And uh, the qualifier is reserved for small changes or build numbers or something like that. So that's how we deal with versioning in, in OSGI. And then there was a second term that Jan Willem briefly mentioned, baselining. I'll explain a little bit about that as well. Uh, baselining is all about comparing your latest build to some latest released version. And when you baseline, you're actually checking if uh, the version in your uh, working environment is still the same as the version that you released. And if they're not, if you correctly bumped the version in your development version. Uh, so it actually uses bytecode analysis to, for example, see have implementations changed uh, or did you change any of your APIs? And uh, it will warn you in your IDE if you make uh, changes that you have incorrectly uh, bumped versions for. So we'll see that in a moment as well. Um, if you want to enable that in Eclipse and you're using BND tools, which is a plugin to do OSGI development, there's a couple of lines that you need to add to your configuration to enable baselining. And uh, that's actually on the slide here below. And uh, the first one is to turn it on. The second line, remove headers is just some headers that uh, by default are generated by BND, uh, but probably don't need, and sometimes they give you false positives when you uh, do baselining. For example, last modified adds a sort of build or creation date to a file, which will always change, so that's not something you want, because then all of a sudden uh, your modules are changing all of the time. So that's baselining and there's a little bit more to it because if you go into more detail about uh, 
uh, APIs and how API changes affect uh, both providers and consumers of such an API, you realize that the reality is a little bit more difficult than the theory that I've just been telling you. Uh, so there are a couple of annotations that you can put on your APIs that sort of signal the intent of an API. And what I mean is you can have some kind of interface uh, that is uh, consumed by somebody. And if you consume an interface and somebody adds a new method to it, it's a backward compatible change. Uh, there's a new method, but you were probably not using that. Uh, so uh, that's, that still works. On the other hand, if you have an interface that you're supposed to implement yourself, adding a method to that interface is no longer a backward compatible change because all of a sudden the Java compiler will start complaining because you haven't implemented that method. Now that has changed with Java 8. We, now we have these default methods, so uh, that's still something we're discussing on how that affects uh, us. But up until Java 8, uh, you had to implement all the methods in an interface. So just by adding these annotations to your API, you're sort of signaling to the tools how this API is intended to be used. So that's a lot of theory about uh, baselining and versioning. Uh, we'll give you a short demo of how this works in Eclipse and how changes will actually be uh, visualized, how you can fix them, etc. So, yeah, Willem? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna give a quick demo. Let me turn off mirroring. Where's the other one? Arrangement. So first uh, to see that I've actually enabled baselining in my build. I've added the two headers that Marcel briefly mentioned to my uh, build in BND. That's the main configuration of uh, BND users. Um, now, baselining is enabled, but since we've not made any releases yet, I first need to have a baseline created. So I need to release my bundles first. And actually in BND tools, that's quite easy to do. I've got a menu option that simply allows me to release all the bundles in one go. And it churns away for a while and then it's done. And if everything went well, to do, you now see the CI release repository is the repository I use to release my bundles to. And it needs, it needs a little time. Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, this is always a scary part, whether it will work. <coughs> and the demo gods are not, ah, here you see. It actually also goes out to the network and refreshes the remote repositories. And since the network is a little bit flaky every now and then, it might take a while. Yeah, so, so you now see that there are a couple of bundles now in our release repository and they're all versioned one. Dot zero, dot zero, dot zero. That's the default. If you haven't specified any version, then it will simply assume that you release the first version. So if I'm now going to change something, for example, a provider typed interface. Yeah, this is an interface that uh, tells BND that the consumers of this interface, of, uh, that, that people are consuming this interface. So if I make a change here, then this means a backward compatible change. For example, uh, let us add Build, build, build automatically, perhaps even better. You see there's now an error marker, perhaps because I've got an implementation. Let's not focus on the implementation itself, but 
once I made my implementation change, you see that there are a couple of other error appear, errors appear. BND has in the introspected the bytecode and seen, hey, you made a change. This is a breaking change for your, uh, for, uh, at least for your versioning. So you should, it, it provides you an, uh, a suggestion what the version uh, it should be. And it says version 1.0.0, the current version is too low. It must be at least 1.1. So if I go to the BND file and change this, it now says, hey, this one is good, but there's still another one. I've also changed an implementation. So I've made an implementation change. This is a micro change because nobody's going to be affected unless I use it bundle. And it will tell me that I need to bump this version as well. Oh. And there's still one more because you also changed the API. So yep. the package that the API is in also needs to be bumped. So here you're seeing both API being changed, causing a, a, a change to the package version and the bundle version. So once you save that. This is a strange one. It says that current is 1 plus 1. What is it? Oh, 1.1 is 0. Sorry. Yep. So now I want to keep getting more and more. <laughs> So as you can see already in this example, which is very simple, it's hard to do versioning correctly without tool support. Even with tool support, it takes us a couple yeah. of goes. And in bigger projects, if you don't have tool support for this, you'll, you'll get it wrong. That's yeah. our experience, yeah. Exactly, this is very hard to get correct by hand. So you, need actually, you really need tool support for this. So what happens if I go well, we had a question. question. Uh, yeah, so in regards to tooling, do you guys have quick fixes for that? Yeah, so the question is whether it's possible to have quick fixes for this. Yeah, there actually are quick fixes, but I'm not a fan of quick fixes myself. So I tend to use them, not, not to use them, but it's actually possible to use quick fixes. Uh, another question? Oh. Um, well, for the completeness of the demo, let us also change uh, uh, a consumer typed interface. So these are interfaces that I as user need to implement. So in this uh, example is a customer change listener that is probably gonna be called for every change on a customer, whenever that is. And uh, let's just say that uh, I want to add the old and the new one. Now, BND is also slapping me on the head and tells me that I need to bump the version from 1.1.0 to at least 2.0 because I've now created a large backward incompatible change. I'm not going to fix all the bugs. <laughs> so, the, the point that we want to make here is that you really need tool support for, for having uh, semantic versioning get correctly. And with tool support, it even is still a, a lot of work, but gets easier, and you at least get it reasonably right. So let's, let's continue with our presentation. Now we've seen how semantic versioning works, the problems you have when building modular software. Let's just go into a little more detail about Apache Ace. So Apache Ace is a software distribution framework. It allows you to manage an, an installation or upgrade installation of software on targets. And um, software is in this case very broad. It can be bundles, it can be configurations, or it can be any kind of artifact that you want to deploy on a target that's necessary to get your software up and running on the target. So to give you an idea of how ACE looks like, what components it consists of, on the ultimate right you have the targets, the actual 
places where software is going to be running. And on those targets, a small management agent is running that communicates with the provisioning server through the network. And the provisioning server uses a one or more component repositories to actually retrieve the metadata and the artifacts you want to deploy. And to control everything, you, need, you have a client. And the client we will demo in a short while. But let us continue a little more on the basics of ACE and the terminology we use in it. So the whole idea is that you group artifacts into features and distributions to make them manageable. And the best analogy that we can think of is probably the IKEA catalog. As a consumer, you go to IKEA to buy a, uh, a closet or a bookshelf or whatever. But you're not concerned with how many planks or how many screws you need. That's simply all provided in a distribution. And you get a couple of boxes. In those boxes, everything you need to book, make your cupboard or whatever you have, uh, wanted to, to, to build. But those boxes actually represent the features. So if I have a, a, a Billy bookshelf that uh, has perhaps a, a basic bookshelf with a nice doors, and you get two packages, for one for the, the bookshelf itself and one for the doors. So those are the features. And you can choose which feature you want. Either you need to get them both or you get them in other colors. And in each feature, you break up in the different planks and the screws and the bolts you need. And there's always bolts left. But anyway, so that's, that's the best analogy we could find of how to organize stuff in ACE. And so are those relations always one-to-one? -one? No. Artifacts can belong to multiple features. Yeah. IKEA has standardized their screws and their bolts. So uh, one type of screw can belong to many different types of furniture. Um, perhaps doors are even standardized as well. So I can use a door for different features as well. Um, and I can use doors in different distributions as well. I can choose my white uh, bookshelf to contain black doors, or I can choose to have blue doors, whatever but the distribution itself is still the cupboard. And in the end, um, if the analogy of, uh, to make the analogy complete, uh, if I consider the targets as homes of people, then you also see that many people can have the same billy or the same bookshelf in their closet or different or whatever. So after this brief introduction Apache Ace, I'm going to show you a little how this UI looks like. So this is the main ACE UI. It's, it's very bright, very bright. But uh, let us take the pointer. It's actually several columns for the artifacts. We currently don't have any artifacts. We'll come back to that later. A number of features, a number of distributions, and a number of targets. And a couple of buttons here and well. If I select, for example, this depth feature, the runtime dependencies, you see that it's linked to two distributions. And if I select another, the normal user interface, you see that probably for this demo, we have two different kind of interfaces. So the normal user interface connects to the normal and the fancy interface for the fancy. If I want to see what type of features a distribution contains, then I can simply click on it. And then I see that the fancy distribution contains of Gap's fancy UI and web shop. The whole idea is that you can easily use drag and drop to connect distributions, features, etc., to each other. So now I've connected the fancy web shop to both 
target. At least that was the intent. Yeah. And if I want to unlink it, then it's also possible. So this gives you a brief overview of how the Ace user interface looks like. And the whole idea is that you manage your deployments from this interface or even automate it in case of a CI build. And we come to back how to automate it later on. So how to change our CI workflow to work with OGI and ACE? Well, we still have a version control system. We still have our continuous integration server, so those two parts don't change. But we'll now get, as a result of our CI build, one or more bundles. And more often, more than one than one. Those bundles will end up being placed in one or two OBRs. An OBR is an OSGI bundle repository. It's a kind of file store for bundles, where you have additional metadata, sort of database for your bundles. Then ACE will use those OBRs to provision the software to the actual targets. The build environment needs to be changed as well a little because when the build is actually producing a number of bundles, we need to make sh uh, to test which bundle needs to be updated on the actual target. So if we take the bundles from our build and we compare those to the bundles in the release repository using the baselining functionality of BND, we can determine whether or not a new version needs to be deployed. And once that check has been done, we create a new snapshot version and place that in a snapshot repository. And ACE will use that snapshot repository to actually update the, the artifacts on the various targets that are involved. Before we're going to look and dive deeper into that, we're first going to tell a little more about how to version bundles. Yep. yep, that's why I take over again and yep. I'm going to use a simple example. Uh, let's assume we have an application that consists of three different modules, A, B and C. And we've just released the first version of all of them. And now let's assume we have a change in bundle A. We change some code, maybe we fix the bug or something like that. And let's start looking at versioning from there. And probably most of you are familiar with Maven and the way it uses snapshot versions. And uh, we can sort of create the same thing uh, in the OSGI world, uh, use snapshot as the qualifier. And if we do that, uh, we would have a release repository that still contains the 1.0. Uh, our workspace uh, that probably then ends up with 101.snapshot or something like that. That's usually what you do, bump the version and add snapshot to it. So our snapshot repository would then also, after a build, contain these versions. Now there's, in OSGI, a couple of problems with this approach. Uh, the first one is that actually, uh, due to the ordering of versions in OSGI, a 101 snapshot is considered to be newer than 101 release, which is kind of inconvenient because you want the release to be newer than the snapshots. So that's not, that's not too convenient like this. The second problem that we have is that even though all the bundle, even though a bundle might be called 101 snapshot, the contents of the bundle might be different. They're all versioned the same, but the contents might be different. That becomes kind of hard to then determine, should I really deploy this update or not? And the other thing, even if nothing has changed because we manually bumped the version, it will already be detected as some change, some update. So this is not the ideal approach yet. Another thing we often see 
is, well, let's not use snapshot then as a qualifier. Let's use some kind of timestamp. Okay. Um, we still have the problem that this is a qualifier and therefore it will be considered newer than the release. Um, now, we have sort of reversed the other problems that we have because even though uh, we get a different version all the time, but might be the, the same content of a bundle. So uh, while snapshot was always the same version, content might be different. Now we have version changes all the time, content might still be the same. So it's not what we want either. And the third one, even if nothing changed, you still end up with a new bundle every time you do a build. So what we ended up doing was something slightly different. Uh, we are creating bundles with a version that's actually equal to the release version and add a qualifier to that. Uh, now our versioning works correctly because whatever version the next release is going to be, we bump one of the minor or micro or even major versions and it's always going to be newer than the snapshot that we had. And we actually use some kind of incremental counter in the version that only changes when something inside the bundle actually changes. Like Jan Willem says, we use the baseline tooling to actually check whether something has changed. So once we do that check, we know when we need to bump the version and when not to bump the version. So if nothing has changed, we're not going to deploy anything new. And whenever something changes in our build, we create a new snapshot version and we can deploy that. So that's the way we bundle our uh, version, uh, we version our bundles in, in our CI environment. So briefly going back to how does the environment look like. So we have our CI server and uh, after doing the build, we actually run a script that uh, correctly places all the bundles with the right versions in an OBR. And we have Ace that then picks up these bundles from the OBR and deploys them to the correct targets. And I'm talking about a script. Um, haven't really specified what kind of script that is. And what we actually use for that is a, a script that's more common used in the OSGI environment and that's a script based on the GoGo -Go shell which, well, it's more or less a standard. It's not out of uh, standardization yet, and we're not even sure if it ever will be, but um, I'm still sort of calling it a standard since both Felix and Equinox seem to be standardizing on using this shell anyway, so that's the most important thing. It's always available. It's just a set of bundles. And uh, this shell provides a powerful and extensible scripting language and that's what we actually use to uh, do our deployment of bundles to, to ACE. Um, it's available from Apache Felix, and uh, in Apache ACE, we provide some extra commands to interact with the OBR and to interact with ACE itself. So now I'm gonna get a little bit technical and show you an example of a GoGo -Go script. In case you're not interested in the scripting language itself, on the right, I have sort of a flowchart that explains what the script is doing. So just read the, the flowchart on the right if you're not interested in the exact syntax. Um, what we're doing here basically is first defining all the different repositories that we have. So we just generated a couple of bundles from our build. We're sort of on the fly creating a source repository for that. And then we had the, both the snapshot repository and the release repository. So that's what the first part does, just set that up. And then there's this deploying bundles command that will actually do all the baseline comparisons and generate uh, new versions for bundles that have actually been changed uh, in the build. And that leaves you with a deployed variable here and that's just a collection of all the bundles uh, that it has just deployed using this command. And uh, now that we have the bundles, we also have to tell Apache Ace that we changed things. So our next step is to actually set up a workspace for Ace. And uh, that gives you an environment in the shell 
to work with, just like the web-based interface we, show, we saw before. And then, I'm just going to scroll down a bit. We're going to go into a loop. And for each bundle that we just deployed, we are going to uh, do a couple of things. We'll start with getting some metadata out of the bundle. And we need that a little bit later to define the artifact in ACE. So after we got that metadata out here, uh, we're going to first do a check to see if uh, this bundle was already in Apache ACE. And uh, if it was, we simply echo that it already existed. And if it was not in ACE, we're going to create a new artifact for that bundle. And that we do by talking to the workspace again. And we're going to tell the workspace, create us an artifact with uh, these details. And here you see the variables that we extracted here, again, being filled in in Apache Ace. So that's what, basically what we do for each bundle that we uh, just deployed. And then when we're done, we commit the workspace, which actually affects all the changes. So uh, once it's committed, Ace will start deploying stuff to the actual targets and our script is done, so we simply exit. And we run this script at the end of each successful build. So that's a lot of theory, a lot of talk again about this. Uh, let's see how this works in practice, and this is where we need to keep our fingers crossed a little bit to see if everything works. But well, we're first gonna talk about what example exactly is. Um, we're gonna show a, a sample project I'm about to, I'm about to showcase. It's um, running in a local Git repository. And for convenience, I've added a post commit hook that upon each commit, uh, it will invoke Jenkins to do an automatic build. And in Jenkins, we've added a post build step after successful build to run the, tar the, the GoGo script Marcel just did, uh, demoed. And um, this will tell Ace that something needs to be done and Ace will deploy the, the, the changes to the actual targets. So, now off to the demo. Um, by the way, the demo is uh, taken from a book written by colleagues of ours, Paul Bakker and Bert Erdman. And um, if you wanna know more about modular cloud apps with OCI, you should read the book. We're slightly biased, but you already figured that out, yeah. so. So let's get us back to Eclipse. Well, first let's us revert those changes we made. Um, for this demo, I'm going to modify a small change in a web page. I've not deployed anything yet, but uh, as you can see, I've made a typo here, so let's fix that and commit those changes. Oh, sorry, need to change something. Here's the quick fix. There it is. And it's done. So. So, testing is all right. Yay. Jenkins is now informed that there is a change. It's going to build. This takes a while, 30 seconds or something. So, then I'll pause my music or tell us a joke. Tell us a joke. Um, no. Sorry. So, actually, it's now you can follow what it's doing. And actually, it's the build is built based on Gradle. I'll show you what the build script is looking like. And here you see that the custom build, um, the GoGo script Marcel just mentioned is running and doing his job. 
And you see that it's creating snapshot versions for several of the bundles and uploading that to ACE. And in the end, we see a successful, means that everything has gone okay. So let's see. We now see in the client that all the bundles that are necessary to run the software on the different targets are deployed to ACE. Now I can show what the features are looking like. We have a couple of runtime dependencies. And if I show down, you see the webshop projects. Those are divided as well in the business logic. Those are not UI related. And for this demo, we have got two different types of user interfaces, a fancy and a normal user interface that are consisting now of several bundles as well. So let's deploy those distributions to targets. This is gonna take a little while as well. In the meantime, perhaps I can show you the Jenkins information or the configuration of Jenkins. That even takes time. Actually, it's quite easy. <laughs> I've a oh, little bit above. The build is using Gradle. Um, in the upcoming release of BND, Gradle will be standard supported in BND. But for now, we've manually written a Gradle script that builds our software and, um, well, creates the bundles out of it. And after the build is complete, we'll simply run a little script that releases the bundles to ACE using the script. So let us check whether I've got now my first normal interface up, up and running and a fancy one with a nice blue background and some different titles. The functionality of both applications is more or less the same. You have a couple of stuff you can buy and purchase and then you can go and check out and well, basically you're playing web shop example that you're probably familiar with. Let us make another change. Suppose I want my fancy user interface to be even more fancy. I add a nice background. And uh, after all build problems are fixed, background. One click. Jenkins is already building again. And for this change, actually I made it only a change to the fancy user interface. The bundle that I've changed only is deployed on the fancy target, uh, the target running the fancy web shop. So the end result should be that the normal web shop still remains as is, it's not changed, but the fancy web shop should then have a different background. So let us wait until Jenkins is complete again. Yeah, it is. And if everything is, you see now that I've made a change. There's a new version with CDS 000. And that is actually linked already to the fancy UI. So we've set up ACE to always link to the latest version of the fancy UI bundle. And it automatically picks up the latest version. So in this case, the snapshot version will be deployed. And ha! Huh, a nice purple background. So, and just to prove that the other one isn't changed here, the background remains as is. Would I make another change, of course, then 
any bundle already having a snapshot will get a new snapshot, and so on, and so on, and so on. Did I forgot something? No. No. Let us continue then to our presentation uh, first. So to wrap it up, um, we've shown you how to upgrade or change your typical CI workflow to a workflow in which you can use modular software development and still have the advantages of a CI build and the problems we've found out in practice how they can be solved. Um, if you want to know more about Apache Ace, you can visit its website, it's an Apache project. Or if you want to know more about Amdatu that is being used underneath this demo, you can go to the Amdatu.org website. The plugin we're using for our semantic versioning and for our OCI build support in, our, in Eclipse is called Bean Details. You can find it there. And that's us, Luminous Eel. And if you want to see the demo code of the webshop, want to fork it and create your own webshop interface, it's on Bitbucket. Underneath that location. Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Uh, Any questions? How do you guys do uh, call these like, you committed the code and all of a sudden it's in production. Like, where's the step in the middle that says, you know, it's verified and approved and So the question is, how do you uh, test your code changes? Um, for this demo, I've actually disabled the testing step. Of course, you need to enable this testing step and run your unit test integration steps. And only after those steps are succeeded, then you can deploy to a production server, of course. So you typically wouldn't have a straight through from Smith to... No, 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 no. no. In, in practice, we have all the unit and integration tests. If those succeed, we'll actually first deploy to our uh, sort of live testing environment that always runs the latest version of the code. From there, it goes to testing. We do that about every week. Then we have testers go over all the stuff that we cannot automatically test, and only if they are happy with that, that we go from test to production, or maybe to some better customers in some cases. So it's a few more systems in between, but not to complicate the demo too much and slow down his PC. We simplified it a little bit, but yeah. these are the steps we take for that. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm not really familiar with that. Is that is the repository some type of it similar to the like Maven repository? It is yeah. similar to a Maven repository. Um, Can you use that instead? Of Actually, you have for Nexus, yeah, you have you have a plugin that allows you to expose it as an OBR. Okay. So underneath, you still can use Maven to push every artifact into it, but you can expose it as a native OBR to a to Ace. That, that's a plugin that Nexus supports yeah. so uh, you can just download that and with that support you can even use it as a repository for apache ace so cool. yeah um, and also uh, the uh, promotion to production um, i saw that as a pretty similar thing to like ace tech yeah it, would you still use ace to do your promotion is there a, a way to do it in, in the pool or? it is but it's sort of a manual step because it's a human that decides that but we uh, we can do that in ACE. Uh, but it so. still can be deployed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the idea that we don't change the way we deploy stuff. Uh, we use the same mechanism in development, in testing, and in production. Yep. So it's just a human pressing the yes button, basically. And yeah. that, yep. Any more questions? Now that's but now you're treating it more like a release because it's kind of determined by the change in the code? 
we, well, well, the change in the code determines that it becomes a new snapshot version, we usually call it. Um, we just uh, use a different qualifier to actually keep all the different snapshots apart so we can identify them. Um, but we deploy those to a snapshot repository and do that on purpose because to us a snapshot repository is not something we will ever use in production. So it's just used for all our testing uh, and development servers. And once we release something, uh, we remove that qualifier again and uh, the bundle goes to the release repository and then is used to baseline against again. So you just implement this uh, revision? Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's ready for release and also uh, because uh, depending on what kind of change you have, you might be changing the micro, minor or major version. But that's a decision that you make when you release the bundle. So while you're still developing it, you might be making changes. One time it might be only a bug fix, then it might also be an API change. But only when you release the bundle, that's when you take a look at this version and say, okay, the biggest change we made in this bundle was a minor version, so we bump the minor version of the bundle. So that was determined by the CND? Uh, yep. yep. That, that's all done through bytecode analysis. And that's never going to be perfect because you might make changes to your API that are not reflected in code. My favorite example is a method that returns a Boolean and you change the meaning, which is a stupid example, but not picked up by code, but still a change. So you always have a, a way to manually override the system and say, okay, this has been a major change. So if you do that yourself, BND will comply with that. So, yeah. Uh, yes. We got to stop there. Oh. Okay. Come visit us, Oswald. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.